So, it's time to address the elephant in the room. What are the long-term consequences of lead poisoning? Oh, there you go. All right, okay. That's the one joke I'm gonna do about boomers in this script, and we've got it out of the way. So if you came here for the jokes, that's it. You know, unless I decide to break the rule, which look, I wrote this, well, this particular bit of the script during that particularly bad heat wave in the UK. So maybe I'll try and cheer myself up as we go along. A lot of discourse happens around generations. And while it's kind of tiresome being part of the generation that's accused of killing literally every individual <laughs> fucking bag fell over as I was doing that, fuck me, gave me a shock. But what I was saying was it's tiresome being part of the generation that's accused of killing literally every industry that the press can think of. I wanted to think about why this particular mode of discussing politics, social issues, and apparently consumption habits has come about. Is it a pure media confection? Are we just living totally parallel lives? Are we going to become the thing we hate as we age and become the new boomers, forcing our children and grandchildren to abide by a dying economic model because fuck you, that's why? You can probably tell which side of this I might be leaning on already. I don't know, and I don't think I'm gonna answer all of the big questions here about how these dynamics emerged, but what I will try to do is explain what the superficial issue appears to be and where that might come from and where the generational lens is obscuring certain things and preventing us from seeing certain things and what the actual long game might be as a result of these things. So with the introduction out of the way everyone, as my favourite meat war criminal likes to say, let's do it. What's the deal with the boomers? If we're going to get to the bottom of the question that this section poses, we're going to need to start at the end and kind of work our way back, right? Kind of like a show that question in your maths or physics exams, which I did way too many of when I was younger. So in a way, our question is, show that there's something different about the generations, which is a bit weird to have to do because you would think that while age can bring with it, you know, experience that alters your perspective that the experience is not going to alter your perspective so much that you essentially exist separately from the rest of people and you behave like you're a fucking alien to them. Or maybe you don't behave like an alien. Maybe people simply observe something quite striking when they look at certain bits of data on a generational level. The example I want to take is voting behavior across a couple different places. Here at SK the Crusader, we like to particularly focus on Britain because one, I live here, and two, despite some people who get very angry at you for treating the UK like it's relatively unique, it is ahead of the curve on a lot of things that are likely in the pipeline for a lot of other countries in the Imperial Core. So while it is indeed a normal island, it's actually normal in the literal sense, it's just ahead of the, you know, ahead of the pace that a lot of other countries might be on. With that in mind, let's talk about our favourite thing, you know it, you love it, elections. Elections are, as I've said probably in maybe two other videos at this point, the main way in which a lot of people interact with democracy. And while democracy doesn't end at the ballot box, and there's a whole world of non-electoral political action to be had, I'm looking at them because, one, mainstream interest means we have a lot of data on it, two, it being the main or only way a significant portion of the population interact with democracy means that we're more likely to get an insight into society at large from it, and three, I get to show you lots of pretty graphs that other people have made, and sometimes I've made, depending on well, I guess they may not be as pretty, but look, you you don't have a choice, you're here. I guess you could watch another video. Why would I say that? Anyway, let's take a look at the 2019 UK election and see the breakdown by age. That's stark, right? Like, it's hard to look at that and think that there isn't something going on, because this kind of difference of behaviour, it can't just come from nowhere, given that we all, at least hypothetically, live in the same society. No, I'm not. Yeah, I did deliberately alter it in the script so it didn't, I didn't say the vine. I'm not saying the line. You're not going to jokeify me. 
And that's the basic way in which this discourse manifests, right? The hated boomers are frustrating the political desires and ambitions of the millennials and Gen Z. And yeah, I'm going to lump millennials and Gen Z together for this for reasons that will be clear in a little bit, I think. So just in case you're a Zoomer, just wait. It's going to make sense, I promise. And yeah, I know you're not going to be like us. I get it. It's all right. There's some other statistics that also direct this discourse. For example, this from the ONS helps to explain some of the feelings that the generational game is perhaps a little bit, tiny bit, unfairly rigged in favour of the old. On average, individual wealth increases with age, peaking in the 60 to 64 age group at a level nine times as high as the 30 to 34 age group, before falling in older age groups as people use their wealth to support life in retirement. And bear in mind, when we're talking about 30 to 34 year olds, we're not talking about uni students. I mean, usually you can go to uni later in life and that's good. And we're not talking about people who dicked around in their early 20s and also had unacknowledged depression. Not sure who that's meant to refer to. Hopefully no editor will put some horrible indicator on here. But people who have typically been in employment for at least a decade at the younger end, people who may have or want to have kids, buy a house, I don't know, enjoy life a little bit because you, know, you only get so much of it. But that wealth imbalance might not allow them to do so, especially because these numbers represent averages in wealth distribution. There will be a lot of 30 to 34 year olds who have a lot less wealth and 60 to 64 year olds who have a lot more and those 60 to 64 year olds who have a lot more might well be the ones that these younger people interact with because in the UK the main asset people buy to support their wealth is property that they rent out so yeah resentment can definitely build up the thing is about generations is they're kind of made up right if you imagine the typically accepted boundaries for millennials, it's people born in 1981 to 1996. Now, I was born in 1994. Do I feel closer to someone born in 1981 or someone born in 1997? Like, come on, really? Are we, are we going to have to? Are you going to make me answer that question? But the line has to be drawn somewhere and by someone. And usually, to be honest, that's advertisers because these demographic lines were used in advertising, which is why pollsters use them, because most pollsters do market research, at least in the UK and the US. That being said, for a thing that's totally made up and constructed, it sure does seem to be a good way to describe certain things like common experiences, differences in political behavior, a lot of perceived experiences too. I mean, we've all encountered the angry, balding man in his 60s who thinks that he personally participated in the D-Day landings, even though most of the people who did that are long dead. Which makes, you know, I, I can't even begin to try and figure out what these people actually think, and my hair is getting in my face there. But that particular experience seems to be pervasive among the loud and angry in that generation. So it kind of matters to them and informs how they express themselves as a generation. Let's take millennials, the ultimate middle children of the generations as they currently stand. If you're watching this, you are most likely to be a millennial. So what I'm about to describe will feel a little demoralizing and perhaps cut a little too close to comfort, but I'm on your side here. I promise. I'm one of you, sadly. Millennials, when compared to the previous generations, are more educated. Which is good. That's nice. More likely to be living at home with their parents. Hmm. A little bit less nice, I guess. This is not going to be an easy list to get through. More likely to be in insecure work. Have less wealth than their parents did at their age. I mean, Look at those my parents at age X memes, right? And me at age X memes. That, that's more or less the summary there. They're less likely to own a home than their parents at that age. Less likely to have children. More likely to have mental health issues. Yeah, okay, you, you get the picture. You get the picture. The standard of our lives relative to our parents isn't... What's the nice way to put this? It's not, it's not where we want it to be. Let's put it in the softest and gentlest terms. These things can feel worse when you think about how in the UK at least, and remember, I am cursed with having to live here, so it's my main frame of reference, so no one's allowed to get mad at me for using that. 
that previous generations got to enjoy things like social housing, which meant lower rents generally, cheaper housing relative to their wages, an easier job market to enter. If they went to university, it was free and it would lead to better paying jobs, unlike today where it doesn't necessarily lead you to a job that pays above the median income again. Really burning myself in this video, apparently. Some semblance of a welfare state that wasn't designed solely to punish you or drive you insane. I mean, they had to suffer leaded petrol and some of the most obnoxious fashion choices you can imagine, but all in all, it's hard not to feel a little like we've been cheated in comparison, right? By the very people who say all these things were bad, but they definitely won't relinquish the gains they got through them. These differences express themselves through a lot of things, like those voting differences I shared earlier, but also an intergenerational resentment because even though they are constructs of our, or an advertising man's imagination, uh, there clearly are common experiences, common material realities that are informing these dynamics, which I guess brings us on to the next section quite nicely because we need to see what analysing in this way obscures. What does the generational lens obscure? At the end of the last section, we were coming to the point where we could understand why the generational political lens can feel materially real, right? Like, I pay my rent probably to a, to a boomer, right? Um, although actually, to be fair, I pay my rent to a pile of money, which in a lot of ways might feel and seem worse, really. But anyway, as I've said, there are quite a few problems that Millennials and Gen Z are facing that Boomers and to a lesser extent Gen X they're simply not going to be able to recognise, right? Which is probably where all those insane just take your CV and hand them into company stuff comes from because it really might well have been that simple for them, right? And also it was before the internet really existed for most people, so you know, yeah. I kind of get where they're coming from, right? These imbalances both in our respective experiences and in the actual wealth held by each generation can absolutely feel like they're expressions of class. After all, how many Zuma landlords have you had to rent from? And if you've had to rent from a Zuma landlord, I'm sorry? I, I mean in the sense that I am literally sorry that you've had to rent at all since landlords uh... Anyway, I'll save my thoughts on landlords, maybe for a different video. So what does this lens actually obscure? As an example of what it might obscure in the material sense, let's take a look at this paper by Age UK. As you might imagine, that's a uh, charity that focuses on the interests of the elderly. Although poverty levels are lower than they were 20 years ago, the latest figures show 2.1 million, 18% of pensioners in the UK live in poverty. Rates have risen since 2013 to 14, when 1.6 million, 14% lived in poverty. Some groups are at particular risk. 38% of private tenants and 36% of social rented sector tenants live in poverty compared to 14% of older people who own their home outright. 33% of Asian or Asian British pensioners and 30% of Black or Black British pensioners are in poverty compared to 16% of White pensioners. That might come as a surprise to you if you live in the UK, right? I mean, actually, probably not if you live in the UK, but if you look at the headline statistics of it, that might look to you like a very, very odd thing, right? Because we might think of boomers, which pensioners these days will largely be, as the kind of suburban house-owning dickhead who took advantage of buy-to-let and takes at least a third of your income every month for the service of not having to sleep on the streets. Yes, this person almost certainly exists, right? But if we keep caricaturing generations and treating them like monoliths, we'll end up missing these very important nuances, right? Such as the 18% of pensioners who live in poverty, which I mean, look, look at the UK. I know it's a place I've said shouldn't exist, but that doesn't change the fact that it's swimming in an ocean of ill-gotten wealth. And that's kind of what I'm trying to get at with this video, right? There are issues that the old in our society face that are very much in the wheelhouse of leftist politics, but the surface level partisan split and the wealth disparity that exists might make you less sympathetic to those causes, which is really limiting and to be honest, kind of a sad thing on all sides. I suppose if you want a selfish reason to care about these issues, I know you're not selfish, I know, but like, let's say if you wanted one, I'm about to blow your mind, everyone, I want everyone to be sitting down for this. You 
will be old one day. Yeah, I know, shocking, right? So in the context of the austerity that the UK has gone through since 2010, the inflating house prices, not just in the UK, but the US as well, student debt, though admittedly the US has an even worse deal than we do in the UK on that one, but it's still shit on both sides, stagnant wages, lack of trade union density, which is caused partially by policy supported by the old, at least, um, party politics right and that the climate is sort of rapidly collapsing around us and the fact that these people are at least if you're looking at it superficially stifling our political expression in electoral politics it might feel good to just be anti-boomer and it's fun too it's just setting us up to be dicked over again later and knowing our luck so far i'm not sure we want to load those dice particularly against us there's also the critical thing that's obscured by thinking of generations and their interests as monoliths, right? Let's look at that voting by age chart again. You'll notice that among, say, the 60 to 69 year olds, that while 57% are voting for the dickhead Tory party, which is a difference of 36 points with the very youngest, that 22% voted for Labour. A Labour Party that their primary mode of media consumption told them was all sorts of things. I think at one point the leader was meant to be a Czechoslovak spy, which, to be honest, makes him sound much cooler than a jam-making pothole cover enthusiast. But I guess the news is supposed to entertain as much as anything else. I wonder if that's a problem, actually. Hmm. Also, you notice that in my age group, at the time of the election, 23% were voting Tory. I mean, I know I made the joke about Zuma landlords, but genuinely there is such a thing as landlord TikTok, and I'm not saying that the landlords are Zoomers, I don't think they're that young, but it drives me absolutely fucking insane. Just check all of this out. I'm gonna throw in a bunch of clips and you can tell me how insane it drove you. I work in London, I live in Buckinghamshire, but I invest up north. Right now we're in Huddersfield, this is Huddersfield. You buy a house here for like £80,000, you're going to rent it for £600. In London, you'll buy a house for £800,000, you're not going to rent it for 10 times the price. So you want to buy low, rent high, with a property manager nearby. People say, oh but Samuel, I have to buy close to where I live so that I can keep an eye on it if there's any problems. That's not financial freedom. That's called a rope around your neck. You want to buy properties in cheap areas, you want to rent them high, and you want to have systems in place and property managers that can make it passive income so that you can have financial freedom. That's called property investing the smart way. And I'm feeling good. Oh my god, I fucking hate those people so much. Whew, okay, alright, I'm calm. I'm calm. So you probably watch those people and one have a similar response that I do and think, what an obnoxious prick. What do I have in common with them? And okay, that's probably a cleaned up version of what you're thinking. Look, this has to exist on YouTube for some reason. That's my point though. It's actually really stupid for us to act like everyone above a certain age is an irredeemable Tory or Republican or, I don't know, name any centre-right to far-right party that enjoys the support of the old. Or that everyone below a certain age is a communist revolutionary suffering under the heel of a boomer capitalist. I have more in common with a 58-year-old private renter than I do with that all of those fucking TikTok landlord dickheads, right? And it just kind of sucks that this lens works as a way to obscure that rather than enhance that understanding. The long game. Since this is focused on generations, I want us to think a little bit beyond our immediate future and think about what some of the consequences of this division might be. Because whatever you might think of most political parties, their staff, their ability to understand who their voters are and what gets them to vote for it, and, you know, all of that stuff, because to be honest, I think they're not very good at it. But anyway, when the distinctions are this sharp, they tend to get that and tailor their message to them. 
Okay, well, all right, most rational political parties that don't despise their base tailor their message and their politics to them. Think of the infamous triple lock in the UK on pensions, a policy that protected and enhanced the living standards of pensioners by ensuring that their pensions increased by at least inflation, while wages largely remain stagnant. The real deep consequences are explored in this Financial Times piece we're about to have an excerpt read out from, which, while I don't agree with some of it, especially the bits of it that seem to imply that the Tories aren't right-wing because they've increased the tax burden, when that's entirely consistent with not just neoliberalism, but also capitalism. You know, I don't agree with all of it, but it does, you know, give a voice to what might be some of the long-term consequences of this, especially if you become the party of the old. And you can almost think of a mirror of that, of becoming the party of the young, right? You want to think about what it is to be the part of the young? Imagine the opposite of this. Pundits often puzzle over the identity of today's Tory party. It claims to be right-wing, but has imposed Britain's highest tax burden since 1950. In fact, it's an old people's party. That's a winning strategy in a country where most voters are now over 55, estimate Joe Crisp and Nick Pearce of Bath University. Ballot box Britain is much older than the rest of Britain. Once you're an old people's party, you're free to ignore many things. The dearth of new homes, record low birth rates, the threat of funding for British university research through the EU's Horizon Scheme, reduced opportunities for Britons to work or study abroad, not to mention climate change. Even the economy hardly matters to many pensioners, because they aren't in it. Instead, an old people's party takes a geriatric side in culture wars, keeps house prices rising, and redistributes not to the poor, but to pensioners who last week got a 10% raise, just as rail workers were offered 2%. An old people's party imports a non-voting workforce while encouraging geriatric grumbles about immigration. In effect, the Tories side with wealth, held chiefly by the elderly, against incomes, and then cast that stance as anti-elitists. The Republicans in the US have managed a similar trick. They rage against Obamacare, a rare modern benefit for the under 65s, and block abortions for young women. This makes a lot of sense, right? If your electorate has polarised so much by age, then you might want to engineer policies in a way that keeps your electorate old, yes, but also makes your labour force disenfranchised, as migrants in the UK are. It's also kind of rich for the FT to finally come around to noticing that the Tories side with wealth. Again, it just so happens that wealth correlates with age, but as I've said, it's not the be-all, end-all necessarily, right? There are other consequences too. Overrepresentation of the old in the electorate means that electoral pitches made by supposedly left of centre parties are often too considerate of some of the more regressive cultural views of that particular group. And yes, it's not all boomers, but there's a reason why hollow female Kermit the Frog impersonator Rachel Reeves is saying that she'd be uncomfortable with a trans woman in the bathroom with her, which is really quite a despicable thing to say, but is, at least in part, a consequence of feeling like you need to kowtow to a 60-something-year-old Baz drinking out of his bin in 40-degree weather. Off you toddle. No, no, no come on no, then. Come on, if you want to fight, no, come on, then. Fight, don't say, come oh, on, I'm going to toddle off, oh, no, 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 uh, I want to see your naked body, because I'm a All right, man, then, come on, then, come on, then. Do what they can't do. Come on, then, get out of there, then. Don't say, come on, I've told you to come on. No, 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 come on, come on then. So what are you going to do? I'll knock your bloody nose down your throat. All right, then go on then. You th ah! In the long run, people will also point out inane things like you get more conservative as you get older, and that's just not true, first of all, or it's not necessarily true. And if it does happen, it's usually as a response to your material conditions changing. Since people seem to be of the belief that young people are always significantly to the left of older people, let's take some actual examples and compare them. I've got the demographic breakdown of the 1983 election, which I'll have made into a nice graph probably. Uh, you, I'll leave a link to all of the original data down below so that you can check it and see that I'm not bullshitting you, but here's the graph. And yeah, Right? Okay, well, isn't that interesting? The Tories are, are ahead of, uh, of Labour in all categories, right? That's the 1983 election. You might not be shocked to hear that Labour did quite badly in that one. But if we compare that with the same pollster, now, this has to be 
an approximation on my part because they use different demographic categories now. Again, I will leave the original data down below so that you can all go verify that I'm not bullshitting you. So this is kind of an eyeball approximation, but I've tried to make it into the same demographic group so we can actually compare it. And we have to bear in mind, this isn't people getting more conservative as they get older when we look at individual elections, but people who have had wildly different life experiences. However, one thing I would like us to note that could be important is the difference in voting for each party based on those age groups and how much this has become a thing. So, you know, in 1983, you can see here that the change between different demographic groups is much less stark than it was in 2019 right? The polarization along these lines has become more intense, right? I'm not pretending like there was zero difference. There, there was a difference, right? I'm not, I'm, not a, I'm not a maniac. I can see the difference between two numbers, right? But the polarization's become more intense because it's not always been like this, right? Back then, the young were Tories, and not massively to the left of the general electorate. Now the young are about 23 points more left-wing than the result of the election? That's actually insane, and it's not normal, or at least it wasn't normal. It's become more common now. You've seen this repeated in a lot of countries, and we'll get to some of them later if I have time or space in the script. But our closest neighbour in the UK, Ireland, has seen a similar polarisation, with Sinn Féin now being the party of the young over there also fueled by similar crises like those we face here, like the housing crisis. There's also a further challenge to the generational lens. Eventually, the boomers will no longer be with us. And while that may, if you take this lens too seriously, feel like a moment to celebrate, I have two words of caution for you. Well, a word and a letter. Gen X, who are going to be more vicious than the boomers ever were, and a concept called inheritance. Now, if it were up to me, inheritance would be taxed at a punitive level, and this might not be such an issue. But the fact is that some of this wealth will reach some of the people in our generation. And then what? If we've been fixated on the boomers, it's going to be really difficult to convince people that their age mates are the real problem. Because wasn't it the big bad boomers who are holding us back? And the resulting frustration on all sides will be suboptimal to say the least. I also want to issue a word of caution. If you're a nerd like me, you'll know that in France, the national rally led by Marine Le Pen did uncomfortably well in both the parliamentary and presidential elections, but she did especially well in the presidential election among the young, which uh, isn't great and is a sign that this tension isn't solely useful for left of center change. And that's the key word, by the way, change. Because we all know that this situation is untenable. We feel it innately. And given the recent heat wave, we felt one of the ways that this is untenable quite literally. It's not just leftists who are able to exploit disenfranchisement and generational angst. And that means we have to build a better, stronger argument. But I guess I'll try and wrap all of this up in the conclusion. Concluding thoughts. As a way of closing, I just wanted to think about how this polarization feels and how it feels real, right? I'm lucky in that my parents are communists and that their lives took a little longer than their peers to come together, which means when I'm comparing, I actually don't feel that bad sometimes. But for a lot of us, that isn't the case. And I understand that. And it can be polarizing. I mean, how many people have you met? who say they've lost their parents to the Daily Mail or that weird Facebook group where they're complaining about the bins that they're a member of. This polarization isn't just real, it might be preventing us from reaching natural allies beyond our generation, which, by the way, is a made-up thing anyway. I can't get over the fact that they are just made up. I also wanted to reflect a little on the causes of generational politics throughout this, the stark difference between you know, where people my age are compared to our parents' generations, the what I would describe as a tough housing situation. Y you get it, we went over it. The main clash is that we've lived totally different lives under totally different pressures, by the way. And while people might like to pretend that as we get older and become grown up, which, look, is a load of fucking bullshit, if I can be honest about it, that we'll become more right-wing, but it's the material basis of our lives that'll dictate whether that happens or not. And just a spoiler alert, it 
won't necessarily happen for most of us. We can see this polarization in places like America, where the young voted in the Democratic primary overwhelmingly for Bernie Sanders, uh, in Ireland, right, with Sinn Féin, we mentioned them, or in France, if you want a counterexample to the Le Pen example, the left wing, you know, to centre left alliance, uh, Nup, Nupes, Nup, I don't know, I don't speak French, guys. I'm really sorry to any French people watching this. But they took a significant portion of the youth vote. And there are parties and movements that are geared directly towards young people specifically. And given how little they get involved in even the basic engagement of politics, that's good. And it's a real tension that actually has some material basis. It's just not everything that, in the way that some people seem to want to make it everything right and with that i think i've summed it up as best i can i need to thank my proofreaders that is my partner and mick wright uh you can find mick's stuff down in the description below he is fantastic and has put up with a lot of scripts that he's had to read from me i just want to thank my patrons over on the patreon and I don't know, maybe I'll make a fancy graphic, or if not, they will appear here now. And I want to particularly thank, Str <laughs> I want to particularly thank Drone Riff, Mercutio, Nauseam, and Kersley Scheider, who are my top tier subscribers over on the Patreon. Thank you very much. If you want uh, just early access to at least one video a month, uh, you want uh, access to the Discord, if you want to be canvassed for potential topics for the videos and to vote for the topic of future videos, uh, head on over to the Discord. The lowest tier is £1. You'll get access to the video game review early. You'll get to vote on the topic. And I might, you know, throw in some other stuff. You usually get all of the, uh, all of the random thoughts that enter my head that might end up becoming scripts and stuff like that sometimes. I also want to just say again that uh, I realise that I kind of act like everyone knows everything that I do. There will be links to everything that I do down below, but in particular I have a podcast piece at home where I torture some friends about Turkish politics in particular and history. I have a Twitch where I play video games and watch YouTube videos actually an awful lot of the time. Uh, Thursdays to Sundays, 6 to 9 UK time. Uh, remember everyone, also, that I had some fantastic voice people for this, so I want to particularly thank my voice people for this. Uh, Ross, who goes by Mr. Gump over on Twitch.tv, go check out his fantastic stuff. Uh, Red Robbo, who um, simply wants Bolsonaro out in Brazil, which is a thing that I think all of us will agree with. That sounds pretty dope. And uh, Jordan, who many people are saying does the music for Peace at Home. Well, isn't that interesting? But everyone, I want to thank them. You can find all their good stuff down below. Uh, remember to like and subscribe. I'm bad at this stuff. Please forgive me that it's all coming out in one big jumble. But otherwise, I'm going to catch you all in the next one. Take it easy. Have a good day. And uh, see ya.